Hi everyone, thanks so much for joining us today at this webinar. Um, I know it's been a bit difficult for, for some people to join and I hope that everyone will be able to stay on the webinar throughout with load shedding and that kind of thing happening. So um, luckily we've already had our load shedding for the day so we won't have any interruptions during the webinar. Um, today we'll be discussing the legal collections process for a rear levies in sectional title. Now, um, I am, uh, we are uh, recording this webinar and we will be um, answering quer uh, queries as we go along. So please feel free to, uh, to put your questions into the chat box, into the Q&A box, and we will try and answer your questions throughout the webinar. If we don't get to all the questions today, we will um, respond to them afterwards and send them out via email after. Um, after this email, you'll also um, after this webinar, you'll also get an email with a link to the recording, plus the the slide that we'll be going through today, and all the um, extra free resources that we'll be discussing during the webinar. So I want to just start by introducing our speakers for today. So I think a lot of you know Vili Ruas, he's the CEO of Stratofin, and Vili has practiced as a property attorney for over 20 years. He has been involved in sectional title management for over eight years, and he has started, he started Stratofin in 2014 with the goal of assisting community schemes with responsible solutions for funding without catching them in a debt trap. Our second speaker today is Marilisa Berger. She is the head of legal at Stratofin. And Marilisa is an admitted attorney and the head of legal at Stratofin. She has worked in debt collection for the past five years, of which two have been in bank collections and the other three in levy collections. So I'm going to hand over to Vili and he's going to take us through it. Morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us again. Um, and to all of those who are having an Easter, um, we hope that you will have a blessed Easter period. Um, and for those that are going away, please be safe on the roads. Um, so I'm going to start out um, with just quickly um, what Stratofin does. Um, we have found out that people think that we're a training company. Um, and that was a bit of a shock. Um, although we try and train as much as we possibly can, that is not what Stratofin do. We are a financial services business that assists body corporates with financial problems um, in the sectional title and homeowners environment. Um, and we do so by way of our unique model of debt purchasing, where we purchase the outstanding levy book of a body corporate at an agreed price. And we will then proceed to collect those debtors at our risk and at our cost. Um, and the body corporate will have the cash flow that is generated out of this purchase of the debtor's book. Um, it is not a loan. They don't have to repay us. Um, there is no burden on the paying owners in respect of, of that. And uh, the body corporate immediately has cash flow. We've also registered as a financial services provider under the National Credit Act, and we also do fixed loans or asset finance for bodies corporate. So if your body corporate requires funding for painting project or a lift or something similar, then we have a product for that as well. That is not connected to the outstanding debtors or levy book. So it is not going to be a, a product where you will pay interest ad infinitum until those levies have been collected. Um, so it is a term loan over a specific period that can be afforded or that is affordable to the body corporate. Um, and then we have a hybrid model where your body corporate does have a lot of um, outstanding levies uh, where we can purchase that levy book if there's then a shortfall for whatever project you still want to do out of that money that you wanted to raise that we can then assist with a loan in that regard as well. Um, so a hybrid of the two. So that's what Stratofin actually does. Um, and that then means that we actually do a lot of collections. So a core part of our business is the collection of outstanding levies. Um, we outsource this to various firms of attorneys. I see Mr. Yershop um, from Schuler Yershop is also on here. Welcome, Rudy. So they're also one of our panel attorneys. Um, so there you go. Um, now you know who we use um, or one of the firms that we use. Um, so yeah, so the, the legal process for the collection of levies we've broken up into three 
portions, rock solid raising of the levees, rock solid internal collection process, and then the rock solid external collection process. And we believe that all three of those uh, elements must be there to make it possible for a body corporate to actually recover levies. So the first process or the first part of that is the rock solid raising of levies. And that is to ensure that levies are raised in a legal and compliant manner in terms of the sectional title schemes management act and the rules and in such a way that one can prove your claim to a court of law. So there is an obligation on bodies corporate to raise levies in terms of section three of the sectional title schemes management act. So trustees and the body corporate must ensure that levies are raised and that income is collected to pay for the maintenance, upkeep and administration of a scheme. So in general, a court requires that there should be a budget. So trustees needs to draft a budget with the managing agent. Um, that budget then needs to um, be presented to the owners at an AGM. Just regarding the budget, you need to make sure that you've got your cash flow right in that. Um, what we see from a practical point of view is that a body corporate will say, well, we're going to raise a million rand, um, but they forget that all members will not pay um, on the appropriate time um, every month, and therefore you would not necessarily have sufficient cash flow to pay your expenses. So you need to build up a bit of a reserve in your administrative budget as well. Um, and you need to build up a bit of fat into your administrative budget so that you are able to pay all your, all your uh, expenses for that specific month. Um, we also see that bodies corporate don't include write-offs. Um, so we are going to discuss that. It, it, it's, um, there will be a position where monies has to be written off or monies can be written off in terms of the rules. Um, need to make provision for the non-collection collection of money. Um, and something that we find that most body corporates don't do is that they don't budget for legal fees. Now, in terms of the old sectional titles act, it was very easy uh, for a body corporate because all they did is they would then um, charge the legal fees right onto an owner's account and that owner would be liable for the payment thereof. The new act um, has made a change to that. And you can only write those levies um, or debit the account with those um, legal fees onto the levy account once the fees have been taxed. Um, and it's taxed if you've got a court order and it's then brought before an official of the court, which is called the taxing master. And he determined the reasonableness of those, um, of those levies. Um, so, so that, that then only can, can a body corporate uh, put that onto the account. So it then means that um, the body corporate will have to pay for legal fees out of the administrative budget. It's also um, seldom that an attorney would charge the same fee as what the taxed fee would be. An attorney would charge on an attorney and own client scale. So that is a higher scale than the scale that a court will generally grant. And, um, and therefore, um, you would not be able to recover all the fees. You will be able to recover on the lower scale, but pay on the higher scale. And the difference between the two scales will be paid out of the administrative budget. So it's important that a scheme does budget for that as well. Once the budget has been drafted or drawn up, then it must go to an AGM uh, for approval thereof. Um, trustees are entitled to raise the budget at the end of the financial year until the next AGM by 10% uh, without the owner's approval. Um, and they can do so to ensure that there is sufficient money coming into the kitty um, whilst uh, this process of an AGM is going to take place. The notice of the AGM has to be served at the primary sections of owners by registered post 
delivery or by fax or by email. So those are the mechanisms that is um, given in prescribed management rule 15, 4A and section three and four of the sectional title schemes management act. We need to have a quorum. So there always has to be a quorum. If there wasn't a quorum, then obviously the meeting has to stand over till the next week to determine or to have a quorum. 30 minutes after uh, that meeting has to be uh, has to start then all who are present will then form a quorum and then um, a decision a legitimate or legal decision can be taken at that meeting the budget must then be approved um, with or without changes by the owners um, and they need to vote on that and need to then approve that uh, they need to elect trustees at that AGM and those trustees must then have a trustees meeting after the AGM to then implement the AGM decision in respect of the levies that were raised. They will then at that meeting de determine the date from which these levies will become applicable the manner in which, uh, which it has to be paid, and they can also grant a discount of up to 10% um, for a single payment for, for payment of the levies upfront uh, per annum. So, so that is the first time that we can see that trustees have the authority to actually write off um, some levies in respect of the upfront payment thereof. Um, we have had um, various matters where we went through the court process and the court started imposing stricter um, requirements than the ones that I've just mentioned um, in respect of the raising of levies and they, for example, required the uh, uh, the letter uh, by the trustees in terms of prescribed management rule 25 um, sent to the owners informing them of the higher levy. So in the matter of uh, Kibler and Okabeng, uh, the High Court have now found that, that although it is a requirement of the rules, um, the non-sending of that letter does not invalidate the charging of the levies. So if that has not been sent out, it does not mean that the body corporate cannot recover these levies through the legal process. Um, we've had uh, various problems or a lot of problems in, uh, in various courts, and, uh, but I think the largest problem that we had was in the Randberg Magistrates Court, Marilisa. Yes. Um, I mean, you're dealing with those. So I think that's where we, we experienced the, the largest problem in respect of that. Right. Um, then, obviously, um, we need to have a rock-solid internal process as well in respect of the collection of levies. So we try and first collect the levies on the inside before we start moving towards collecting through the legal process. So there will be a trustee's resolution in terms of section 3.2 um, that then uh, requires then the raising of the levies um, and management rule 25 um, will determine when it, it will be payable by way of decision of the trustees or resolution of the trustees in that respect. Owners can also then place restrictions on trustees in respect of, of the raising of levies and any other matter. Um, however, they can never restrict the collection of levies. That is one of the core functions of a body corporate is to raise and collect those levies. And as such, owners can't tell trustees that they are not entitled to recover. Where trustees cannot recover or did not recover, and it has a detrimental effect on the scheme, owners will be entitled in terms of section nine of the sectional title schemes management act to actually institute action on behalf of the body corporate against um, a person in default um, to recover monies in respect of the body corporate so even owners can go to that um, length 
Um, that was one of the discussions that uh, myself and Zerlinda van der Merwe had with the chief ombud last week, Monday, um, when we were discussing poppy and the non-furnishing of information to owners on the basis that um, it is um, a contravention of the poppy act. So if, if that, that information over real levies and debtors are not given to owners, owners are deprived of their right in terms of Section 9 of the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act. So it's one of the points that I've made, and it's one of the points that CISOs are looking at currently. Trustees must also determine the interest applicable in terms of an interest resolution in terms of Management Rule 21.3. The interest uh, can be a staggered interest rate, um, so we've seen many schemes that apply a staggered interest rate where for the first month or two months, there will be a lower interest rate, and when somebody gets into arrears over a, an extended period of time, three months, four months to six months or whatever, that a higher interest rate are applicable to those. There's nothing that prohibits trustees from implementing a resolution to that effect. And we see that effectively being used by many bodies corporate uh, where they don't want to penalize owners that have maybe run into a short term cash flow problem and can't pay today, but will only pay next week. Um, and they treat that differently from owners that are non-compliant owners that just refuse to pay levy levies over a longer period of time. Um, then, obviously, um, your internal process, you also need to make sure that only legally raised amounts are debited against the, um, against the owner's account, levy account. Um, so you can't raise penalties unless it is in your rules, the amount is in the rules, and those rules have been approved by CISOS. Um, can't raise admin fees. Um, unless it's in the fee, in the in the rules as well, um, no SMSs, letters, these type of things. Unless you are a debt collector, and it is in terms of the Debt Collectors Act, um, and that fee can then because then that was regarded as a tax fee or an agreed or a, a reasonable fee in accordance with that legislation, and that can then be placed onto the account. Um, so also, like we said earlier on, no attorney's fees can be put onto the, uh, onto the account until such a time as it has been taxed. Right. Um, we suggest that trustees would implement a credit policy. Um, so on our website, uh, we have a draft credit policy under our free resources. So all trustees or people that are interested in that can just click on that and have a look at the policy. That policy has to be uh, brought in line for your specific needs at your scheme. So we've just looked at the matters that one would generally find in there. And we have, we have just drafted it in such a manner um, but you can read, you can read or redo it or, or bring additional things in that you require in that respect. So you can, for example, have a grace period of seven days in there. Um, first demand after 14 days, um, a formal demand, say after 21 days, and then after 30 days, um, you will then refer the matter to either CISOS or to the courts, depending on the process that you follow um, in, in, at, at your body corporate or through your managing agent. Um, we also, um, we, Stratofin is involved, um, change the sequence of allocation um, because in law, in general law, um, payments are first allocated towards the oldest debt and then towards the newer debt. Um, so you will first be paying towards the old debt that has been there for the last two years and then only the, the new levies. We believe that by changing the sequence in the credit policy um, to apply towards your newest debt, that means whatever the debtor pays is allocated towards his current levy. 
um, means that the outstanding amount remains in place. And when you issue summons, uh, it is easier to then prove that that amount is owing in the sense that uh, a debtor does not just keep on being in arrears to the same amount and by actually extinguishing the debt. So by the time you get to court, he's actually ex extinguished the old debt, but the new debt is still there and it's still the same amount because mm -hmm. that will then be able to be raised as a defense um, that mm -hmm. the amount that you issue summons on um, is no longer there. And then so, you have to so, start again. Then you have to restart mm -hmm. again. So I think from our point of view, we have, we have, um, we have changed it in, in respect of schemes where, all, where we are involved in and it makes it much easier for Marilisa and her team to actually do the collections. What do you say about that, Marilisa? Is it yeah. that... Yeah, and I think just for if they want to issue, if it's if if Stratovin, for example, can't purchase the debt and it's a lower amount and they give instruction to an attorney, um, it's just better to to have this in place so that you don't have to continuously pay fees for every time for new summons to be issued. Perfect. Um We've, we've thrown in here um, a point six where we just um, saying compliance checklist. Um, I think the last webinar that we did was on compliance. Um, we have finalized that compliance checklist. Um, there are uh, suggestions. We've had suggestions of what we can still put in there, and we are going to put those in as well. Um, but that compliance checklist is actually something that you can use um, in this whole process to ensure that you have followed the correct process in respect of the issuing of levies um, and um, that you have, you have also followed the Sectional Title Schemes Management Act and other acts in respect of your compliance and you've got all the right documents at hand and you are keeping them for the correct period of time. Some documents, for example, trustees resolutions um, and so forth has to be kept in, at infinitum, so forever, um, minute books and so forth. Um, certain other documents need to be kept for shorter periods um, in terms of the um, income tax and so forth. So all those periods are dealt with in that compliance document. So have a look at that on the website as well. Um, it is a very useful tool to get your body corporate in compliance and make sure that you have raised your levies in, an, in a compliant um, manner. In respect of the internal process to collect um, I have found during the days that I was still managing schemes um, that where the trustees invite the defaulters to a trustees meeting, explain to them the reason why levies are raised, uh, what the function thereof is, what it's to be used for, um, and the effect of the non-payment of levies and then have a discussion with them at a trustees meeting and say, this is what the problem is. You are causing this cash flow problem for the scheme. Um, can we agree with you that you from here on forthwith will pay the levies on the correct dates uh, in respect of the arrears? Uh, can, can we come to an arrangement? And it's always better for a scheme to come to an arrangement with an owner, get an owner to sign an acknowledgement of debt in respect of those arrear levies. Um, and uh, then get the owner to pay that rather than go through the legal process. I think when we get to the legal process, Marilisa will explain how long it takes um, and the risks involved in that. Um, and therefore, it's always better to actually just have this document that is signed by the owner that says, I owe the money and I'm going to pay X amount per month over the next six months or eight months or 12 months or whatever the cash flow and the income and expenditure of that owner allows for the additional payment. But make sure that you get the current levy from here on forthwith and make that part of your acknowledgement of debt. And if he defaults in paying current, then it defaults on the arrears as well. Um, because in that way, you then have a legal document that says he owes the money and a defense will be very difficult to be raised under those circumstances. Um, require the verbal undertaking, confirm the verbal undertaking in a letter. Um, if there's a repeat of this and he doesn't pay, then get the AOD, get it signed. Um, make sure that you have a written document that 
confirms what amount is is owing and what will be recovered. Um, we've also um, allocated certain trustees to portions of the scheme. So, for example, a, a scheme that a 12 story building, we have divided that between the six trustees and each had two floors and they would then also go and discuss where there were defaults on uh, these uh, acknowledgements of debt just go and discuss it again try and get the owner to understand to pay um, so all those things assist um, we do see in some schemes that it becomes a problem um, and where you see that it is a problem then rather stop don't further aggravate the cir circumstances walk away from it and then deal with it through the legal process but it is it is always better to actually have a discussion and see if you can't get payment rather than go to CSOS and rather go to the courts um, as I said earlier on about staggered interest rates uh, we, we we experienced that it's a it's a good mechanism um, to actually punish those that are actually serial defaulters um, rather than the person that just slipped up for one day or two days and now that person has to pay an enormous amount of interest uh, to the scheme. Implement your policy, uh, your credit policy um, by way of resolution, distribute that in the scheme so that owners will know how the trustees will act when there are arrears. That will let them know that this is what's going to follow. They will understand the process. They will understand what's happening. And once you start the process with that specific owner, they will know that you mean business and you are going to follow through because they see that you are acting in accordance with your policy. Okay. We already had a bit of a chat about this, your legal fees on your owner statements um, only to be debited, I think, on sectional title living South Africa. We're seeing that this is one of the major problems where people complain that legal fees are debited to their accounts uh, without court orders being in place in that respect. Um, cannot happen that has to be debited to a legal expense account of the body corporate and to be paid out of the administrative budget until such a time as that uh, order was granted and the bill was taxed through the taxing master then you can put that on and only the amount that is taxed um, not a not a higher amount not a different amount that's the amount that you are entitled to then debit the balance between that and what was debited um, it must be paid out of the administrative budget. Okay. If an owner agrees on legal fees, then obviously it can also be um, debited to the owner's account. So part of the acknowledgement of debt process, um, and I think that any attorney um, worth its salt when drafting an acknowledgement of debt will have a cost clause in there make sure that the owner then agrees that if legal action is taken as a result of the non-compliance of this um, acknowledgement of debt that you can then recover those legal fees on an attorney and own client scale that is then an agreement in terms of management rule 25 and you can then as the body corporate debit the full amount against that owner's account and the compliant owners does not carry a portion of that legal liability in respect of those fees. Um, so make sure that you've got that into your acknowledgement of debt and that you then apply that once, uh, once the debtor is again in default and does not comply with the acknowledgement of debt. Okay, rock solid external process. Um, I think the first thing um, that one can do is refer matters to CSOS. Um, I like to say that it's not a free service. All compliant owners or all owners in South Africa pays a fee towards CSOS until they are no longer members of a scheme. So definitely not a free service. Um, in actual fact, a very expensive service. I think they would be recovering over a billion rand a year in respect of, of levies, um, if they have all these schemes on board. Uh, currently, they don't have. They are working towards the changing of legislation 
to make it a criminal offence for the non-payment of CISOS levies. There is no teeth at the moment in that regard, but um, we have been informed that they are busy with amendments to actually four schemes. And then the scheme executives, which would be the trustees or the directors of a homeowners association, uh, would be liable for a fine or imprisonment if they do not do so. So that's coming. Um, so um, not a free service, um, but be that as it may. Um, we do not refer any matters ourselves through to CSOS. Uh, we make use of the court system. We believe um, that the inherent risks in respect of CSOS is too high. Um, there's no appeal on facts. So that means if the adjudicator get the factual position wrong, then you can't appeal that order. Um, I think that most attorneys will tell you that about half of all court cases that went on appeal were incorrectly determined on fact. So it is a common problem in courts that facts are misinterpreted or they don't get the facts completely right and a decision is then made on those incorrect facts and as such, um, then there's no appeal if you go through the CSOS process. If you go through a court of law, then obviously you can appeal a mistake in fact. Um, I'm saying there's no certainty of outcome. Um, the reason why I'm saying there's no certainty of outcome is that we have seen many adjudication orders um, where similar facts are presented to an adjudicator and then it's different adjudicators in different places in throughout South Africa and they come to a different conclusion on the same set of facts. Um, we That has been acknowledged by the chief ombud that that is a problem and they are building up a um, bundle or, or precedent or a workbook mm -hmm. or whatever one would call it um, where they will then put in that if there are similar facts that that would have the similar outcome but at this stage um, it is then upon that specific adjudicator and there is no precedent um, in, in that regard so we say it is a problem we also believe it's a problem that there is no legal representation. Many matters are very complex and um, requires legal representation. And unless the adjudicator allows it, there's no legal representation in that regard. Um, we're also currently seeing um, that all the applications are done on the papers. So there are no physical um, adjudications currently taking place. And also, um, there is also no right to choose the adjudicator. The right to choose the, your own adjudicator was based on the payment of your fee. And because CISOS has done away with that, the 50 Rand, um, they now believe that they have the right to appoint an adjudicator and owners and schemes have no say in who is appointed any longer. So, um, so we, we believe there are inherent risks in, in this regard. Um, the biggest risk that we see in respect of CISOS orders is the risk of applying prescription. Um, so we see prescription being applied in CISOS orders in contravention of Section 31B and 131E of the Prescription Act. Um, that says that a, as long as you are a member of a governing body of, um, of a, a governing, you are a member of a governing body, that prescription will be suspended. Um, so, and you can only unbecome a member of a scheme once you have sold your unit, you have paid your area levies, a clearance certificate has been issued in terms of section 15B3, and the unit has been, um, has been uh, transferred out of your name. So um, from that point of view, we believe that there is a huge risk in the respect of CISOs applying prescription, which we believe should not take place. Um, we are busy currently with an article so that we will publish um, shortly. Uh, Dr. Karen Durham, um, formerly from Prof. Paddock's um, 
business um, is writing an article on that as well and we will make that available to you all as well um, on our website where we actually deal with the whole argument regarding prescription um, i don't know daniela if that is already available but it will be available shortly yes it is available is it available perfect okay um then um Attorneys, the appointment of attorneys. So if you if you decide not to go through CSOS, um, the appointment of attorneys, I'm saying they're horses for courses. Um, make sure that you choose attorneys that understand the sectional title and homeowners association space and what is required to take mm -hmm. a matter from issuing of summons up to sale in execution of the immovable property. So I've um, actually learned the hard way on on vetting attorneys because you would think debt collection is so general general across board, but once we've started working with specialists that actually understands the raising of levies, how to argue this, I mean it just it makes makes it much more worth it, and you don't waste your money as much. <laughs> definitely, um, we we see from our side many schemes that come to Stratafin after matters have been with attorneys for many years where mm -hmm. they have not been able to get to the sale and execution of the immovable property because the property is bonded or it is a primary residence and so forth so therefore you need attorneys that actually have gone through this process understand how it works and understand the law surrounding that and that law changes on a monthly basis i think um uh, rudy yershop can can actually tell us and we, we should actually have a webinar just specifically on um, the Steinmiller and Marsh Rose matter uh, where Rudy is now extensively um, involved in um, on behalf of the, the community, um, the, the sectional title community at large, um, where, where this can change in one court matter, we, we can see that the law changes and the way that one needs to collect changes. Um, so you need an attorney that specializes in this and that actually um, knows what the law changes are and keeps abreast of, of those changes. Um, so important to choose horses for courses, not necessarily your divorce lawyer um, or your friend or the attorney that does contracts in the scheme. Get somebody that understands collections and collections in the in the in the sectional title and homeowners association space. Um, understand the fee structure, understand attorney and own client fees, understand that that fee is a higher fee than what you can recover from the debtor, understand what a party and party fee is and the difference between um, attorney and own client and, and party and party, and try and negotiate with your attorneys to stay as close as possible to party and party fees because at the end of the day, that is what you will be able to recover from the debtor. And if there is a huge discrepancy between party and party and attorney and client, and the attorneys are going to hate me for this, but if there's a huge discrepancy between the two, um, which they are entitled to charge, um, then the scheme and the compliant owners through the administrative budget will pay for that. And that will come out of your money that you can spend on the maintenance and upkeep and other um, necessities of the scheme. Um, so make sure that you understand the difference and that you can discuss that with, with your attorneys. Um, right. I think, Marilisa, um, I want to bring you in here. This is your, your field of expertise in choosing the courts. This is what you guys daily do with your, with your teams of attorneys. Um, so tell us a bit about the different courts and how you guys go about in choosing courts. So we were actually forced um, a while back for the last couple of years by it was a matter between um, various banks actually where they said because of the monetary value of the claim is lower than 400,000 so it falls within the, mag the magistrate court we had to go to the match court where we didn't really have the option to go to high court um, and which made it a bit more difficult for us because you can 
in general, you can choose where you want to go. Um, so the plaintiff, that be the body corporate, can make that decision. Um, but the the only the 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 downside of that is that you will be, um, you know, you can get a cost to, well, based on the cost, uh, the, the order can say, well, cost at match courts um, or a lower court scale. Um, but we have been forced, so we've worked through the match court quite often um, and we've realized or that it becomes quite difficult to get orders, proper orders granted um, in terms of even default judgment. So we had that query, we mentioned it earlier with the um, letter of demand um, in terms of prescribed management rule 25, where they would basically refuse the judgments or they would continuously send queries and delay the process in um, granting those judgments for us. Um, and we've just experienced that high court, uh, going to the high court, the judges, because they are able to make decisions um, based on their own, or they can use their discretion in making these decisions. We've had much more um, or much better success rate in the high court. Um, and especially when it comes to um, um, granting orders to sell the property. Um, we've had um, of, of various um, problems. So you mentioned here the section 65 where they will say, they will tell us we must go back and serve on various times where in terms of the rule, we can serve on the domicilium, but they want personal service. So it goes back and back. And then in terms of 65, where they want you to um, enter into arrangement. And if the debtor can only pay 500 rand a month towards his um, uh, 100,000 rand arrear levies, and then the order gets granted, and then we're stuck with that monthly repayment. So we've, we've, um, in my opinion, and I think in many um, others' opinion, that it's best to go through the High Court, um, and it takes faster as well, definitely time frame. Um, um, you know, and as you mentioned here below, the, in terms of the period. Um, we are experiencing with high court, especially now that everything, well, here in Johannesburg, um, everything is done via case line. So it's much faster. Um, and we are able to go through the undefended process within 24 months. Um, although unfortunately defended is much, um, much longer now making it up to 60 months, which is quite a tedious process then. <laughs> yeah. So so the the, the 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 risks in respect of going through the high court rather than the magistrate's court i mean is what you outlined um there is a difference between the party and party scale in the magistrate's court to the party and party scale in the high court so if you then go through the high court and your matter fell within the um, financial jurisdiction of the magistrate's court the court will then only grant a cost order in respect of the magistrate's court party and party fees but you would have paid fees on an attorney and client or on a party and party scale in the high court so that means that owners in the scheme through the administrative budget would then be liable to pay that fee and you won't be able to recover that from the debtor but from our point of view, like you said, um, we think that um, the time periods and the fact that we get certainty of orders have made it uh, for us more viable to actually go through the high court rather than the magistrate's court. Um, and we've got a far better efficiency in respect of obtaining orders there. Um, just regarding the attachment of the immovable property, so in the magistrate's court, you can attach the immovable property and to sell that in execution. Um, the, uh, the, the magistrate's court attachment process is in terms of section 66 of the magistrate's court act. And the process in the high court is rule 46 of the high court rules. They are very similar. However, we have found that the outcome in the High Court is far more positive and that we can get an order to sell that property um, much easier in the High Court or the, the court applies the, the, the law, um, I would mm -hmm. think, better and allows for this property to be sold. Because in the magistrate's court, they do focus on the owner's section 26 right to housing, a lot and they tend to then not want to grant an order 
um, and don't want the property to be sold and want the body corporate to accept a payment arrangement, even if that payment arrangement is less than the interest that is, that is payable on the debt, um, rather than to sell that property in execution, which would give cash flow to the scheme. And secondly, probably a new owner that will now pay levies um, on a monthly basis. So from that point of view, it has a negative effect on a scheme. If you can't sell that property, if you've tried everything, you've tried your rock solid internal process, you've tried your external process, you have served the summons, you have spoken to the debtor whilst you're going through the legal process and try and get the debtor to pay and still the debtor does not pay, then it is definitely better to get to the point where you can sell that property and you then uh, get a new owner into the scheme and the scheme can then proceed. So, so in general, we see that undefended matters take between 18 to 24 months. We did see that period extend through the period of COVID because the courts were not operational. And then defended matters, anything from 24 to 60 months. So up to five years to get that matter when it's defended, to get that matter to finality and sell that property um, in execution. Um, there, are, there are alternative processes that one can follow. So you can, for example, attach the rental. So where there is a tenant in the property, you can then make use of Section 391F of the CISOS Act to then attach the rental of the debtor. Uh, of the debtor's tenant, and if there is a tenant in the property, and then in that way, utilize that money for the payment of the area levies. Um, one can also, through the magistrate's court, attach somebody's salary, um, and through the high court, one also gets orders for the disconnection of services, um, which obviously needs to be followed before you disconnect services. We will have a chat about that this just the year after, where, for example, the matter that we've seen on social media the last two days. So make sure that your scheme does have an order to disconnect. Don't just go and do that. It's spoliation. You are not entitled to do so in terms of the law. So I'm saying here, don't take the law into our own hands, into your own hands as trustees or as the scheme, um, uh, the scheme's managing agent. Um, utilize the legal process to legally do so. Um, I think Marilisa can give us an example of what happened with one of the schemes that we are assisting or in the process of assisting when yeah. they, as a last attempt, try to cut people's electricity to get them to pay. So that actually backfired completely because they then approached CSOS. Um, so what happened is the body corporate switched off the electricity and the owner then went to CSOS to dispute or to get it switched on again. And it turned out that CSOS even went as far as to um, decide, which is completely against Section 17 of the, prescribed, uh, the Prescription Act, um, that they literally just decided that the a portion, I think it was over 300,000 that um, has prescribed, and this owner is now liable for much less than he initially went. So not only was um, they slapped on the wrist for switching off the electricity, but um, they also got an order um, where the majority of the levies had to be written off, which I think... Uh, which, which obviously is incorrect. I mean, one can yes. appeal that in law because that is a fact. Uh, it's not a, not a dispute of fact, but a dispute of law. So that mm -hmm. is something that we advise them to do. Um, and um, as such, um, we are looking at that for that scheme. Um, I'm just seeing questions that are being raised. The process where there's a bond over the property, people think that the property can't be sold in execution. It's not true. Um, a bondholder is not the owner of the property. They just have a preference right in respect of the, the monies attained at a sale in execution of that property. That's what a bond is. So they're just a preference creditor. Um, so they stand first in the queue in respect of the payment of monies. So if there is a bond over the property, the bank will be required in terms of the rules to give us a certificate of balance to say what they would accept as a minimum or the minimum bid. 
um, and that property can then be sold on execution. If the minimum bid is then attained, then the property is sold, that goes to the bank. The new purchaser will then pay the outstanding levies to get, um, to get transfer of the property into his name in terms of the conditions of sale. Um, if the, if the minimum bid is not attained, then the body corporate must go back to the, to the court and explain why the minimum bid was not attained. Um, and that also becomes a to and fro between the sheriffs and the court. So it can take a couple of times to actually go back and explain. And eventually a court will grant a minimum price or reserve price that will enable the property to be sold in execution. So it is a longer process. So therefore, if a property is bonded, it is more difficult to sell that property than an unbonded property, but it is not an impossibility. Um, we sell many properties in sales in execution that are bonded. Um, it is similarly also more difficult to sell a property that is a primary resident, a residence um, rather than a secondary residence um, or a, a investment property. Um, and it's also more difficult to sell a property of old people uh, without income than to sell a property belonging to a youngster. So these are all facts that courts take into consideration when they, when they uh, grant orders for the sale of properties. Um, and one needs to motivate um, your, your reason for the sale of that property properly. And that's why it's important to deal with horses for courses. Those attorneys that understand what is required, understand the law, have got the knowledge and experience that have gone through this process um, and, and know exactly how to do this. Um, because we see many, many, many properties that have come to a certain stage and then the attorneys just say, well, we can't go further. The court has refused an order. Um, and that is not where it ends, uh, but you need to get experts involved then um, and you need to get people like Stratofin involved that, that knows and understand the process, that do this on a daily basis. Uh, because we've been through this, we understand the process. Um, so, yeah. Um, just regarding costs again, um, your attorney and client fee is dependent on the agreement that you reach with your attorney. Um, so the attorney will tell you, I work at 3,000 rand an hour. Some other attorneys will work at 10,000 rand an hour and other attorneys will work at 300 rand an hour. So, so that, is, that is what you need to determine. Um, the tax scale or party and party scale is dependent on specifically on specifically um, the specific step that was taken. So issuing of a summons, there's a specific amount for that. Drafting of the summons, there's a specific amount of it. So it doesn't depend on the time period. It depends on what was done. Um, so you can see that an attorney that charges you per hour can charge far more for the drafting of a summons than what would be allowed. So the rules might allow 450 rand for the drafting, um, but it has taken three hours and at 3,000 rand an hour, it will cost you 9,000 rand. So we see attorney and client fees, anything ranging from 60 to 120,000 rand on matters uh, up to sale in execution, dependent on what firm of attorneys you use or what attorney you use um, and where you can actually tax that bill only to the extent of 25 to 30,000 rand. Um, so the, if, your, if your fee, your attorney and client fee was 120,000 Rand and you tax your bill for, uh, for 30,000 Rand, then the scheme will be liable for the 90,000 Rand out of the administrative budget. So the paying owners will be liable for that. So make sure that you understand the difference between the two and that you deal with it um, with your attorneys. Um, we've had a bit of a chat about the sales in execution, um, the things that need to be taken into consideration. Obviously, courts take into consideration the constitutionality of that sale. So we go and have a look. Is it a primary residence? What is the age of the occupier? Is the person indigent or not? Uh, what is the size of the debt? The court, a court won't grant an order for the execution, sale and execution of an immovable property where a, a minuscule amount of 5,000 Rand is owing in respect of that debt. It is just not fair to take somebody's house away for a debt of 5,000 Rand. So Stratofin would only get involved where the debts are of a substantial nature, um, where we actually can get to sales in execution. 
Uh, Marilisa, currently, where are we looking at around that where courts grant those orders? Um, then it's very difficult, um, but we, I think you have to put, um, you have to get your papers in order and you have to have a good case on that. Um, with regards to, I'm looking at the matter with the changing tides, um, Judge Fisher made it very clear that, um, you know, it's not as easy as one would think to just lower or get the bond um, to be lowered in order to sell the property. I saw a question here earlier on where someone asked, does it mean that the bond doesn't get paid? It actually doesn't. It puts the burden back on the owner, but now the bank doesn't have a security, doesn't have the property as a security, but they, um, the person now has to continue to pay the bond. So um, it isn't as easy as one would think. Um, um, we, you know, it's, it's, but you know, with uh, like you said, having the right attorneys in place, um, and also making sure that you've built your case from the beginning. So where you have mentioned earlier on your internal collections, make sure that those things are in place so that you can show that you've tried all possible. Re um, you've, you've, you know, you've tried in every area as possible to get the person to um, commit to an arrangement or to accommodate the person before we have to sell the property. So um, I've asked you how much more or less, and I think from, from what we are seeing in, in mm. practice is around about uh, 45, 50,000 Rand. If that is the amount owing, um, then courts are getting to the point where they say, well, it is a substantial amount and this body corporate is being prejudiced by the non-payment of this amount. And they start then exercising their discretion in favor of schemes. Um, so although it is not that easy, um, it, does, uh, it does happen and it happens frequently. I mean, I think we've had 10 sales in execution last week Monday, if I remember correctly. So, mm -hmm. so, so those things do happen. Yeah. So it's not an impossibility. Um, also regarding the bond, uh, Marilisa is correct. Uh, the bond holder will get whatever was uh, paid for the property at, at the auction. So say, for example, an offer or a bid was made at 10,000 Rand, that 10,000 Rand will go to the bond holder as the secure creditor. And then the body corporate will be paid uh, because of the contract that is in place with the new purchaser to pay the levies to get transfer. The bondholder will then still have a right to pursue that debtor for the balance of the outstanding bond, um, but not as a secured creditor any longer, but now as a concurrent creditor, so a creditor that stands in the queue. Um, so yeah, so the court will take all these things into consideration. Um, to, to make those decisions, the age, as I said, of the occupier, if there's children, if the person is indigent, if it's a primary residence, the size of the debt, if there's a bond, um, but also the well-being of the scheme. So where we have schemes where there is um, non-payment of levies um, in a huge um, mass of people, um, courts are more willing in those schemes to then grant those orders because the well-being of that scheme is reliant upon the recovery of those levies and bringing new people into the purchase of uh, after paying of levies. So yeah, so I think that's that's uh, about it in respect of of the collections process. Um, there are other outsourced alternatives, um, for example, um, the Stratofin model, where you can outsource your risk um, to us, and we will then purchase those levies. We will go through that process. Um, that is what we do on a daily basis. Um, so it is possible to do that. Also possible to come to an arrangement with attorneys to work on a contingency basis. Um, However, um, from our experience, we have seen that most attorneys that work on a contingency basis is not going to put that much effort into that matter. And we have seen that those that were handled on that basis took a very, very long period of time and actually didn't really come to fruition because the, the attorney says, well, let me put some effort into it, but not all my effort because I still have to pay my staff and I still have to make sure that, um, that I can run my business. But if this comes through, then I'm going to be happy because I'm going to get a bit of money out of this as well. So it's almost like a side bet for an attorney then. Um, and, and I don't think that most of the attorneys specializing in um, levy collections will actually work on that basis. 
Um, so be careful of that. Um, and if you go for a, a outsourced alternative like that, uh, make sure that you monitor the process very carefully and keep to timelines and time frames. Thanks, guys. I think perfect. That's Thank good. you so much. Thanks so much to Vili and to Marilisa for giving us that um, in very informative chat. Now, um, I see that there are a couple of questions. Veronica has been awesome in in responding to most of the questions that have come through. I see there are one or two that she wasn't able to to get to. So what we'll do is we'll take those and we will um, answer them and then share the answers with you. But um, yes, thank you. We will send the recording after this. We'll put it onto YouTube and then send an email out to everyone with the recording, with the, um, the presentation or the slides and with um, all the free resources that were discussed today. So thank you so much, everyone. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your, your day to, to attend this with us. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.